The title for Mehmet Fox is, How Much Faith is Necessary? Have faith in your own faith. Have faith enough in yourself to believe that you really have enough faith to move mountains. Is this a strange idea? Probably it is for many people, yet Jesus taught it. People are constantly saying that they wish they had more faith. Because if they had, they could get better results. You have to realize, however, that this attitude of mine is extremely negative. It is affirming, although indirectly, that your faith is very poor, and you know what that means. Jesus said that the very smallest amount of faith, like a grain of mustard seed, is sufficient. If you have faith enough to pray at all, you have enough faith to start with. If you have no faith, you would not be praying. Have faith in your own faith, and that in itself will build it up more and more until the work is done. There's a short scripture from the Gospel of John, chapter 20, verse 27. Be not faithless, but believing. Well, there's a lot of people right now who are hurting, who don't have faith. Um, I've, last week I talked about dealing with the little deaths in our lives. And I was led to mention then that I would talk about the Ministry of Comfort, uh, sort of a revisit, because I talked about it uh, back in 2015, but I... I've rewritten it a fair amount this time. And of course, I had no idea that we would be dealing with yet another major mass murder, to say nothing of the minor mass murders. You know, they count anything over four casualties as a mass, a, a mass murder or a mass attack. And here we are. So what I, what I want to do is address this not just in terms of these massacres, but in terms of all the different major sources of stress and loss that people are experiencing right now. Uh, one source said that they believe those, those under sufficient enough stress to need some sort of mental health support has jumped from the nor what we'll call the normal, like two years ago, a year ago, 60% of the population past 80%. Well, this calls those of us who are in the spiritual walk into service more than usual. And so I want to talk about how can we be in service and how not to be in service. And uh, I'm going to start with a piece from a book I found 1901 called The Ministry of Comfort by J.R. Miller. Um, he, uh, he writes, uh, a theological professor used to say to his students, never fail in any service to have at least a word of comfort. No congregation, however small, even assembles, but there is in it one person in sorrow who will go away unhelped if in scripture lesson, hymn, or prayer there is nothing to lift up a heavy heart. And then the, uh, the writer goes on to um, discuss how the ministry of comfort can help hearts become braver and stronger when facing uh, what the writer calls hard, the hard and painful events of life. Uh, now, I want to step sort of outside the seminary because George Fox, the founder, or one of the founders of Quakerism, the, the best known founder, if you will, as I've said in other talks, he came to understand that there's that spark of God that exists in every one of us, in the heart of every one of us, and that we are responsible to learning 
to listen to that spark within ourselves for the guidance of what to do next. We are responsible to fan that spark within us to a bright flame. We have the responsibility, Fox preached often, to minister to others, to be one of God's ministers to the world. And ministering to others outside of evangelism or proselytizing, that's part of giving comfort. So let's start with the definition. What does comfort entail? From Merriam Webster. To cause someone to feel less worried, less upset, frightened, etc., to give strength and hope, to ease the grief and trouble of. I had the uh, unexpected pleasure this morning of listening to On Being, the radio program that deals with spiritual topics on National Public Radio. And there was an interview with a poet and uh, religious philosopher, David White. Um, and he spoke, among other things, about dealing with the grief based on losing perhaps his closest religious friend and fellow poet. Uh, and he said, a grief journey will take you to dark places you never imagined. Creativity will light your path home. And then, I believe this was part of a poem, but it may not have been. He said, and this was with regard to this particular gentleman who died. But when he went, it was like the other half of me disappeared. And we have this physical experience in loss of falling toward something. It's like falling in love except it's falling into grief. You're falling towards the foundation that they held for you in your life that you didn't realize they were holding. And you fall and fall and fall and you don't find it for the longest time. The shock of the loss to begin with and the hermetic sealing off is necessary in grief. But then there comes a time when you finally actually start to touch the ground that they were holding for you. And it's from that ground that you step off into your new life. Now, I'm sharing this with you because to me it is such a clear, powerful definition of what someone with loss is experiencing, what someone with loss is experiencing that we must minister to. And then White goes on uh, saying, to maximize our efficiency in the Ministry of Comfort, I've modified words here a bit, we need to be willing to be vulnerable. He says, vulnerability is a guardian of integrity. It's what sustains the creative spirit. It's what resilient people have in common. If we are brave enough, often enough, we will fail or we will fall. This is the physics of vulnerability. However we may formulate it, uh, the statement went on, the equation holds true, uncomfortably, undevastatingly, often intolerably true. Although we may intellectually recognize how essential vulnerability is to our aliveness and every significant expression of it, we remain astonishingly averse to being vulnerable, expending tremendous resources on constructing elaborate and ultimately illusory defenses against this basic condition of being alive. And when I read this, or heard it then, I found it later uh, transcribed, I thought back to myself back when I was in my most damaged and how hard I worked to make sure that vulnerable as I was, nobody ever discovered it. And reflecting on that, uh, I realized how many people I had sent off from my life by my refusal to be real, to be vulnerable. Um, then he, uh, he made another comment on vulnerability. He said, vulnerability is not a weakness, 
a passing in disposition or something we can arrange to do without. Vulnerability is not a choice. Vulnerability is the underlying, ever-present and abiding undercurrent of our natural state. To run from vulnerability is to run from the essence of our nature. The attempt to be invulnerable is the vain attempt to become something we are not, and most especially to close off our understanding of the grief of others. More seriously, in refusing our vulnerability, we refuse the help needed at every turn of our existence and immobilize the essential title and conversational foundations of our identity. To capsulize, if we are to engage in the ministry of comfort, we cannot come on as Superman or Superwoman. In fact, I find myself thinking back at Superman comics. I don't recall anyone sharing their inmost secrets with Superman or Superwoman. There needs to be approachability. So, who do you know that needs comfort? There are the obvious. The grieving parents down in Texas, in Tennessee, in so many of the other tragedies of shooting or of needless death, whether violent or not violent. They're the visible ones, someone in obvious grief or other obvious loss. Tornado victims would be a good example. The death of a loved one. You know, any, even an expected death. The grief is there. The loss is there. But there are also other types of obvious, a tr troubled marriage, a troubled person in the family that's grieving for the loss of that person in terms of being able to work with them. The loss of a career, the loss of a job. Those are obvious ones. But then there are the less visible ones or the invisible ones. People living with personal troubles that they keep inside, with self-doubt, feeling lost, feeling not sure what they will do next, feeling like they have no knowledge of career or what can happen next in their lives. Uh, I'm remembering ages ago when Lyft was just starting up, I visited the minister of a mega church, wanting to demonstrate Lyft to him, hoping that he would be interested enough that his other ministers of the church would decide to have them train in Lyft for working with their congregants. And one of the beliefs of the three I demonstrated that showed up was, um, I am insufficient. And those of you who are familiar with Lyft, we've had them go into a self-hug and say, I think it was 12 times, I am sufficient. By the time he got to the sixth one, it was everything he could do to keep from sobbing in front of us. And by God, he was not going to let that happen. <laughs> While he was stuttering out the last six. I did not know a way to offer him a ministry of comfort. But boy, did he need it. For all the trappings of being the leader of this megachurch, here's someone so fractured inside. We need to be aware of those too, speaking to them sometimes with a nudge that we may not understand. And then you add in people who are just too alone, who aren't getting the, uh, the recognition, the touch on the shoulder, the acknowledgement that they exist, that they're worth something. So many people hurting. So many people hurting. 
We can't reach them all. But each of us, should we commit to the ministry of, of the ministry of comfort, can be available to one or to whomever the divine brings in front of us. Now, how do you do comfort? Well, there's two different ways. There's words and there's deeds, and they often can inter intermix. You know, in the old days, if a family was in crisis, the neighbors would drop by casseroles. And now, that doesn't happen so much, but a phone check-in every so often. Uh, in the agony columns that I read, um, every so often someone comments on how much it meant when they were going through their misery that someone checked in every so often. And um, talking about that, I'm reminded of a, a fellow there was an article about, I don't remember when, but his ministry, anyone he met, if he had the opportunity, he found out what their birthday was. And every week he sent out birthday cards to those who had a birthday coming up. He may never see them again, remember, may never talk to them again. But he acknowledged their existence and that he remembered them. And then there's more, how to put it, more powerful, well, more impactful deeds. Uh, in obvious ways, Harold Hill, in one of his books, wrote about uh, a family where the daughter had just been killed in a, a car accident. And one of the men went, who lived in the neighborhood went over to the family and greeted everyone, found the father in the family room just sitting on the couch, sobbing his heart out. And this gentleman just went over, sat down, put his arm around him and cried with him. Didn't say any words, just cried with him. Be open to how you are called and how you can give that ministry of comfort. There are, there are no rules. There's no fixed way. In terms of deeds, when my ex-wife ran off with her therapist, took the kids with her, I was devastated. And I spent my whole previous years with the family, I was completely out of touch. And I, at least I had the wisdom to go back and go to a, find a folk dance group. And I showed up the first time and they, they sort of figured out what was going on. And I found myself just being invited to this event or that event or a cookout. Those folks didn't make a big deal out of it, but they included me at a time when I had nothing else. Now, there's lots of things not to do, and let's just acknowledge some. Um, if the family's mourning, I wouldn't suggest hosting a keg party, unless it's a wake. You know, Irish wake, different story. Um, I certainly wouldn't bring a handmade coffin to someone who's very ill. Let's take a look at words, because that's where a lot of people trip up. Uh, some easy and easy traps to fall in on, if you will, that I've heard of myself or encountered. Uh, oh, God must have wanted him more than you did for the death of a child. What did you do to deserve this? Oh, I'm sure he's happier on the other side. Well, you know, they say the tough times you go through make you stronger. The problem with these is they're all explain-aways. Or, I know what you're going through. That's presumptuous. No, you don't. You, you have your own experience, perhaps, but it's not the same. Um, I came across an article today. I, I mentioned God was preparing this. Um, an article in, uh, on the Yahoo News site by Jeannie Sullivan. Um, 
uh, and she said, or wrote, if you want to support friends, family, and acquaintances who are suffering from trauma, rule number one, skip the words, everything has a purpose. She goes on to say, I'm going to read a good section of what she wrote, please don't place purpose on other people's trauma. The purpose may actually eventually exist around our devastation, but only because we found it. We worked for it. We answered the hard questions and cried for hours trying to release enough pain to grab hold of it. She goes on to say, Sure, I can see purpose in why God made the blue sky, the grass green, the sunshine. I can get behind that, but I don't believe God somehow expects us to find purpose in our trauma. We can choose, however, to find purpose after we first open ourselves to healing the wound itself. And this reminds me of Viktor Frankl. Um, I now forget the uh, logotherapy, that's what it was. Helping people find reason to continue to exist in the face of huge trauma. Now, he was helping survivors of Holocaust who lost everything, their entire family, their children, their wife or, love or husband, their home, their job, their, their nation. We're not, I hope, going to have to face that level of damage. But we cannot talk it away. We should not talk it away. She goes on to say, when you can look at a friend or stranger and often genuine compassion by saying, I've been there, it sucks. And I'm going to walk through you, through this with you. That is one way of showing a ministry of compassion. And notice how it recall, requires vulnerability. Now, I've been in situations where I had no idea. I haven't been through what they have. But I can still acknowledge it. I can only imagine how much this must hurt. And then whatever I can offer to walk with them, to care with them. So you can acknowledge their pain, that you're aware of it, that you're empathetic with it. You can tell them how sad you are that they're having to experience it. For things un uh, unexpected or relatively minor, I may say, Ouch, I'm so hot, sorry to hear that. A big hug sometimes, but you got to check. Some of them don't want to be hugged. To some, the hug might actually exacerbate whatever trauma they've been through. And as I was writing this, I was reminded of an article or a, a column of Dear Abby, where a woman wrote about how her, hus her, her husband, yes, her husband, had been killed in a tragic accident. And she was still grieving, back at work, but still grieving two, three weeks later. And it hurt so much that everyone was just carrying on normal business. And she wrote about how at one point she was walking down a hallway and a worker from another part of the company, whom she didn't know, was coming the other way and stopped her and said, I understand your husband died. You must have cared a lot about him make him your husband. He opened the door to an empty room. Will you come in and tell me about your husband? She said that 20 minutes sharing her memories of him made all the difference. Made all the difference. Each of us can do that at the right moment. So, those are people who are in pivotal crisis points, if you will, or long-term, sort of low-grade crisis. But then there's everyday people who maybe are living alone and don't have any support system or insufficient support system. Well, my mother, even when we were young and easily embarrassable, would go out of her way to recognize it, acknowledge people's existence. 
Uh, the one I remember, I was a teenager, we were walking down the sidewalk in downtown Lakewood, and this frail-looking old lady was walking the other way in a bright red coat. And as we passed, my mother looked at her and said, you make that red coat look so good, and kept on walking. Bears the hell out of me. But think what it did for that person. And when she died, because of circumstances, we couldn't have a memorial service till about three months later. And because she had only lived in that town, she was living with my sister at the time for two or three years. We did not expect much because we have no family to speak of. The room at the, at the funeral home was filled. It was filled with neighbors, filled with tradesmen where she had bought food or whatever. And what struck me, what, the one I remember was a butcher who stood up and talked about every time she came in, she always found something to compliment him about, the quality of the cut or the quality of his chickens. That meant enough that three months after this customer died, he showed up at her funeral. Each of us can have that sort of impact on people we may not know at all. But we can recognize that spark of God within them, that they are divine. When nobody else, they may experience that nobody else is. So in general social situations, where you may know nothing about them, you can still often find something to give them a positive unit of recognition. Even if it's nothing like, oh, it's good to see you again. Tell me something cool that's been happening in your life. If they've got no one else to tell, you just showed that you cared. And they do have someone who can get excited about the new job, the new pet, whatever it is. That's ministry of comfort. Even small pieces of comfort can go a long way when somebody is hurting. This church, to me, the, all of us here, this is a ministry each of us can participate in. And we should feel called to participate in it. Because we're used to walking in the Spirit. We're used to feeling nudges. It's okay to speak to someone we don't know and lift them up. And as you do this work, as you walk through life, you'll have so many opportunities to really touch people's lives in a positive way. And it may be, you may be the only person that day who will reach out and recognize them for being. And if they're in more difficult situations, it may not be even days or weeks before they hear another one. Now, if you're not used to doing this sort of caring outreach, it might feel awkward at first, but if you keep practicing, keep doing this kind of loving outreach, even to strangers. You'll get used to it. You may even find that it feels good. Because in doing this, you are helping even the silent hurting, the invisible hurting, discover that they are more visible, more lovable. And you're also setting an example of how they can reach out to others. So in other words, let us, by showing love and caring to others, whether we know them or not, whether they're here or grieving in Texas, and we may have to do that by prayer, by intercessory prayer, let us increase the lifting up of others in this world 
one by one or in groups to help them find a happier place in this divine world. And in doing this, we can help bit by bit the entire world arrive to a happier state of being, a less stressed state of being, and long term, a more spiritual and more loving state of being. I came across this writing which Liz must have provided sometime because I recognize her artwork on it. Uh, let us take this as our benediction and as our walk this week. Uh, and it's from Marianne Williamson. I release into infinite love who I am, what I feel, what I have, and what I do. May my gift, may my, may my life, gifts, and talents be used in whatever way serves love and peace. I release into love my experiences of failure and any pain still in my heart. I release into love my experiences of success and the hopes that they contain. May the light of loving kindness shine deep within my heart and extend through me to bless the world with miracles. And so it is. <laughs>